Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. Nice and brisk and cool. And uh, we're glad to see you here on what is Reformation Sunday. How many of you knew that it was Reformation Sunday? How many of you even know what Reformation Sunday is about? How many of you know what the Reformation was about? Well, you're going to learn today. So, we're glad to see you here. There's a couple things I'd like to point out to you in the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, one is the election night supper on Tuesday, the 4th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, says we're in need of donations and our volunteers to help with the meal. A clipboard with a sign-up sheet will be passed around and to please consider signing up. Also, uh, Fridays from noon to 1, they've resumed their weekly lunches. We'd love to see more of you there. I was there this last Friday. This afternoon, after the church service at the Methodist Church, I believe it is, they're having their spaghetti luncheon. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities for food in the coming week. And, uh, and so I encourage you to attend those different things. So... Um, are there any other announcements before we go into the birthdays and stuff that anybody wants to make? I, yes. I got a thank you card from um, Christy Hamilton. Just wanted to thank us for the prayers, cards, and money. Uh, started my treatments, had to fill all my meds after leaving the hospital. Money came in very handy. Thank you very much. Hope to be able to come back to Morningside soon. Tried, but with my treatments, it didn't work out. So, and just so thanks again and take care. That's so, Christy Hamilton sent a thank you. Okay. Anything, any other announcements? Well, we do have birthdays today. Maybe this is why Pam arranged to be gone this week. Uh, Pam's birthday is October 29th, so is Roger's. Don't go anywhere, Roger. And we have Dan Harris and Gage McElhenney on the 30th, and Wanda Harris November 1st. And a happy anniversary to Adam and Amy Herrick on October 30th. And Bob and Kathy calls on the 31st on Halloween. We also have a happy engagement for Kevin and Paul. Oh, well, we'll congratulate them too. But first, let's sing happy birthday to Roger since he's here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. The reason Pam is in here is that she keeps hoping I'll catch up with her. Yeah. <laughs> once again, congratulations on y'all's engagement. I look forward to uh, hopefully working with you on that afterwards. Okay, if there are no other announcements, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
let us reflect on why we come here to worship as we speak and hear the words of the call to worship. Please stand if you are able. Why have you come here? Have you come to move mountains? Mountains of doubt and hurt. Mountains of worry and anger. Mountains of guilt and uncertainty. You can remove these mountains through the power of faith, even as Christ taught us. Strengthen our faith as we worship, O Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. The words of our first hymn were written by Martin Luther, one of the great leaders of the Reformation. Please join me in singing number 22, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
You may be seated. Our responsive reading this morning reminds us of the reality and meaning of our salvation. Please turn with me to number 85 in the responsive reading. So now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us to be. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are good for us. They help us learn to be patient. And patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. Then when that happens, we are able to hold our heads high no matter what happens and know that all is well. For we know how dearly God loves us and we feel his warm love everywhere within us because God has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners who had no use for him. Even if we were good, we really wouldn't expect anyone to die for us, though of course that might be barely possible. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since by his blood he did all this for us as sinners, how much more will he do for us now that he has declared us not guilty? Now he will save us from all of God's wrath to come. And since when we were his enemies, we were brought back to God by the death of his son, what blessings he must have for us now that we are his friends and he is living within us. Now we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends of God. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. His sin, sin spread death throughout the world, so everything began to grow old and die, for all sinned. Yes, that sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes men right with God, so that they can live. Although we are saved, we do still sin. If we say that we do not sin, the truth is not in us, and the only people we deceive are ourselves. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God, first together, and then singly and silently before the throne. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as the poor father said to you, I believe, help my unbelief. So often we doubt, even though your works are in front of us. We hurt knowing the truth of both the freedom and the peace you have promised us. We ask for forgiveness, but refuse to even consider forgiving ourselves or others. Forgive us our failures, both of ourselves and others. Forgive our weakness and strengthen us. Help us to know your power in our lives and to have that assurance of your love and future that will enable us to move mountains in our lives and others. May we forgive others and ourselves and walk in the grace you have so freely given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, you are forgiven. Please be seated. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word as we say together the unison prayer for illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, bread of heaven. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14, and is found on page 1853 in your pew Bible. It seems from what Paul writes to Timothy that Timothy may have been afraid, possibly even prone to be embarrassed by what was happening to Christians like Paul because of their faith. But Paul reminds him of the power of God and tells him not to be afraid or ashamed. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 14. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Our second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and is found on page 1818 in your pew Bible. This is one of the clearest statements in Scripture of how we are saved, not by our works, but by grace through faith, and yet that we are saved to do good works, although we are not saved by them. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ 
and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Our final reading this morning is from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, and is found on page 1888 in your pew Bible. Under the temple system in the Old Testament, only a select few people could become priests. They had to be from the tribe of Levi and from the family of Aaron. But under the new covenant established in Jesus Christ, all who believe are a priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. So this doesn't have anything to do with my sermon, but there's a phrase, you know, Remember I told you about uh, God is good all the time, and all the time? Well, there's another one of those things, too, that the, the readers will say, uh, the word of our Lord, or something like that, and the response to that is, thanks be to God, because hopefully we're thankful that we got to hear God's word. You know, it can't be heard everywhere. And actually, this does, I guess, play into my sermon, because there, every opportunity, there are chance that it may not be able to be heard here at some point in the future. Not in this church, but I'm talking about in the United States. There are a couple of Sundays a year where I preach on a topic specifically rather than a, on a regular basis. I mean, anytime you do a sermon series, it's more topically informed. But there are a couple of Sundays a year where I think that the Sunday that it's named for, or the Sunday that the name is given to, whatever it's it's, it's, it is, is important enough to talk about, and then I go and look for the scriptures to help work with that. I usually start with scriptures and work the other way around, because that's the best way to do it. But there's no scripture specifically dealing with Reformation, and uh, as it was historically. But the Reformation is important to us as Protestants. Another one would be Trinity Sunday. The Trinity is not explicitly mentioned as the Trinity in the Bible. But every Trinity Sunday, I promise you, I'll be preaching on the Trinity. And uh, so, because it's always a mystery to us in that case. In the case of the Reformation, it's important to us historically, particularly as Protestants and Presbyterians. Um, Reformation Sunday is a celebration 
of the Reformation, which was a historical event when a number of people called the Reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, whose name I can't remember his first name, uh, a, a number of other people took a stand against, at that time, what was the Roman Catholic Church. And this is not a Sunday for bashing the Roman Catholic Church either. But it was important that at that point in time that the church and culture of the day had fused together and had made a number of decisions and had set a number of traditions and had made a number of decisions theologically and doctrinally that the reformers, those people like Martin Luther and John Calvin, believed had taken them away from both the Word of God and what was the purpose of us as Christians. And that they were even diluting the gospel itself as far as what saves men and women. And there were five principles that they liked to, that were famous, that they liked to talk about. They called them solas, meaning only or alone. We're going to look primarily at three, but there was scriptura or scripture alone, Christos or Christ alone, fide, which is faith alone, um, gras or gracia, which is grace alone, and then the other one, which I can't remember the, the phrase for it in, in, in the Latin, but it's for the glory of God alone. And these three, five things, they felt, were all being ignored or actually suppressed in the church and culture of the day. And people who went around calling themselves Christians didn't believe in those five foundational truths. And so we're going to look a little bit at some of these. We're going to start with Scripture alone. At the time, the, the, and it still is today, the Catholic Church has always had an understanding that Scripture is only one of the authoritative voices of God. The second one is the church. Now they had 1,500 years of experience in interpreting the Bible, so one might feel that, be able to say that they felt like they had reason to be able to say that. And, but the... There are times when the church seems to move away from what God has proclaimed. Because they look at the knowledge of man and the insights that we have supposedly gained and decide that they know better than the word. Or they interpret the word through that lens in a way that takes us away from what God calls us to do and to be. 2 Timothy, verse, uh, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, there's a verse in there that says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. In 1 Peter 1, uh, there's the passage that talks about how the, wor uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever, which actually comes from Isaiah chapter 40. The point that they were making in that, and the point that we need to understand today, is that this, this is our guide, not just our guide, this is authoritative. This is what shapes, presumably, who we are and how we live. As follower, because that's what Christian means, follower of Christ. We learn about Christ through the Word of God. The Word tells us what God expects of us. The Word tells us how we are to live. It's the Word that should shape our lives. And if you don't know the Word, if you don't study the Word, and they didn't have any study of the Word, one of the um, innovations that they made was, Luther was one of those that uh, translated the Word, the Scriptures, one of the first ones to translate it into the common language. He translated it into German, because that's what he was. You know, and therefore, everybody there could read it, not just some priest who knew Latin or Greek. 
The other thing about it was they insisted on, instead of using the Latin translation as their basis, going back to the Greek and the Hebrew, and we still use that today. Every translation you have out there, well, most translations you have out there that are actual translations and not paraphrases, are based on manuscripts in Greek and Hebrew, not Latin. Because that didn't occur until around 440 A.D. That's a little bit late for all the rest of it. The Word of God is what is fit and profitable for reproof, for correction. Reproof and correction. Notice how those two are first. That means that for those times we stray. Because we're doing our own thing and we're doing it our own way. Somebody using scripture in love can call us to account. Now that's something that the church today doesn't like to practice. This idea of accountability and discipline. Because our culture doesn't like it. And yet there it is in the word that we're supposed to use the word to do exactly that. For training in righteousness, how should we be righteous? How can we talked about the righteousness of God in our sermon series a while back? How can we be righteous? The one of the last sermons I preached on was how do we be holy? That's similar. Well, we learn about how to be holy by looking in what God says in His Word. So scripture is authoritative and we depend on scripture alone for the final authority and interpretation. That doesn't mean the church and its traditions and its interpretations can't have something good to say because they can. But that when it comes down to brass tacks as they like to say, when it comes down to the final word, the final authority, it's got to come from here. It's got to be the Bible. That includes when change occurs. It's not just about conserving things, but when change does occur. I mean, the Reformation was all about change. That's why I say, reformed and reforming according to the Word of God. They were advocating for changes, but they were changes that brought people back to a right relationship with God. Christ alone. John 14, 10, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except by me. Acts 4, 12, where Peter says, There is no other name under heaven or on earth by which men may be saved. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer, it's rhetorical. But let me ask you a question to think about. How often do you hear that today in the public marketplace? Or how often do you hear the opposite? That there's more than one way to God. There's more than one way to be saved. Everything is cool. If we just make peace on earth, it's going to be heaven. That our understanding of God, it's, it's kind of like an elephant. And we have the trunk and maybe the Buddhists have the, the, the leg. and you know, So they, each of us looks at God differently. We understand God differently, but we're not seeing the whole picture. And if we did, we'd understand that they're all valid. And they're all ways to heaven. Well, that's not what Scripture says. It's Christ alone. We cannot earn our way to heaven. No matter how many good works we might do, that in and of itself is not going to get us into heaven. As Pauline said, it's not our works that save us. We do good works because we're saved. Not to save us. And yet, today we have this idea, well, if I'm just a good person... If I do good things, then surely a God who is love will allow me into the gates of heaven. No. I'm sorry. Maybe that's a bummer and bad news you didn't want to hear. But the fact is, unless you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, unless you accept the fact that you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you can never earn your way into heaven on your own. And that you're totally dependent on the love and grace and mercy of Christ. And the Father who is in heaven above by the Holy Spirit. Then you will not get to heaven. 
You need to know him as your Lord and Savior, for it's Christ alone. Faith alone and grace alone. Those are touched on in today's passages, particularly in Ephesians, in its passage, where he talked about it's not works, but it is the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, that is the faith, not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. I love that little line. Why would God make it so that there was no way that we could get in by our own efforts? Could it be because we were always comparing ourselves to other people? How again, how often when you're talking, if you actually analyze what people say and they're comfortable with where they are, it's because, well, I may have my faults, but these people over here, boy, they are a lot worse off than I am. And those people over there that might be better than I am, yeah, maybe, and I should, I should work towards that. How many people would take that moment to be able to boast of, look at all the good things I did. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what Jesus talked about at times when he was giving his sermons and he talked about prayer and he talked about fasting and he says, don't pray on the corners like these guys. Or don't go into the temple and say, thank you, Lord, that I'm not a sinner like this guy down here. He said, pray in secret. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have public prayers. But the point was, is they weren't praying for God and themselves. They were praying for people to hear. Because in their prayers, they would tell about all the things that they did to honor God and how good they were. So that people would honor them. Fasting, he said, don't go around if you're fasting with your faces all long and your cheeks sucked in so that folks know that you're miserable because you're fasting, but you're being miserable for God. So that's a good thing. He said, fast in secret. Put on your best clothes. Go around like there's nothing happening. It's not for people to know. It's for you and God. Because you see, it's not by the works that you do that you're saved. It's not by the works that you do that your place in heaven is going to be determined. It is by God's grace. And the amount that we do should be a response and a measure, not of our need or our place, but our response to God. How much do we love Him? How much do we want to follow him? Depending on his grace today. Why should we care now about this? I mean, that was 500 years ago that the Reformation occurred. Yeah, it was big in its time, but, you know, we, we most of the time, if, if it's older than our own generation, it's, it's ancient history. Just ask any teenager today about World War II. How much they know. Or even the depression. Which some of you have lived through. They don't have a clue. What's the depression? Well it couldn't have possibly been as bad as the depression we're suffering now. Oh buddy you got no idea. Those that have lived through it might say. Even the civil war. It really wasn't that far ago in the grand scheme of things. 1865. It's what, about 150 years coming up. But kids don't know because if it's not prior to their own lifeline, their own lifetime, then it's not really relevant. And they're not the only ones that suffer from that. We all do. We have to work at remembering. That's why I think it's important that we have days of memorial, like Memorial Day, like Veterans Day. Those various times where we remind ourselves. And every Sunday should be a reminder of who we are 
as Christians and as Presbyterians. What's going on in the church today is a problem. And I'm not speaking just of the Presbyterian church, although I have to say that the PCUSA is on the forefront of a lot of it, which is a shame. If that gets me in trouble, so be it. But the fact of the matter is, we have bent to the culture. We have accommodated to the culture to the point to where the culture now has a larger say in the way we approach things, approach people, approach sharing the gospel, approach their problems, approach our reproof and correction and our teaching and training than the Word of God itself does. We talk about in the PCUSA, reformed and always reforming. As if change in and of itself was a good thing just because. But the fact of the matter is, that's not true. The phrase that was originally used was, reformed and always reforming according to the word of God. That's what it originally was. According to what God said, we reform ourselves. According to what God said, we change our lives. According to what God says, and in an attempt to honor God, we change our culture. Starting with our church. Innovation can be good. And some traditions no doubt are bad. We all know those seven deadly words right in the church. We've never done it that way before. Nevertheless, eliminating all traditional understandings to accommodate the culture and the understanding of man will lead us nowhere but to destruction. And I don't think it's any accident that mainline denominations and churches are in decline and have been for the last 40 to 50 years. That doesn't mean we should give up, by the way. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't still stand up prophetically and proclaim the Word of God and who He is. It just means that we've got a little bigger challenge on our hands than we might have had before. You know, in some ways, it's actually a good thing. I know nobody likes to hear that a bad thing's a good thing, because that seems like it's kind of oxymoronic. But the fact is, where the church suffers persecution, the church thrives. And part of the reason why it thrives when the church suffers persecution is because when you are undergoing persecution, all of the frills and things get stripped away. Not that I ever want to face beheading or jail time for my beliefs. But the fact is, those people, they know what they believe. And they are firm in their belief. And understanding, firm to the point that they're willing to stand up to those who would kill them to proclaim Jesus Christ. And perhaps I have just too dim a view of America, America but I just cannot see, you know, over 76% of Americans still call themselves Christian or identify themselves with some church. I cannot imagine 76% of America standing up and proclaiming their faith before the barrel of a gun or the bars of a prison. Heck, we won't even proclaim our faith in the face of people not liking us and making us outcast of our own little cliques here in town. In some ways in America, we need a new reformation. We need once again to understand the foundations of the faith and have people that are willing to stand up for that faith and make a change first in their lives, then in their church, and then in the culture. But to be consistent and authentic throughout it all. 
You see, the Reformation is not something that was over and done 500 years ago. It's still happening today. Because there will always be a war between the world and what the world wants and what God wants. Even in our own lives, Paul talks in Romans about how, I love that little phrase, the tongue twister, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do. Did you catch that or should I say it again? You do what you don't want to do and you don't do what you do want to do. Because the carnal man is giving you impulses and having you do things that the spiritual man says is wrong and dishonors God. We're new creatures. We would never have a chance to win the battle before. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a battle to be fought. We need a new reformation here in America, today, in our towns, in our cities, and in our churches, sometimes in our families. And it starts with you. Don't care what your age is. Don't care what your education is. It starts with you. You know, there's that song, Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. There's another new song out by Matthew West called Do Something. And I'm going to read you the lyrics. I, I didn't remember or think of this song in time to get Bob the, the tune. It says, I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble now, Thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. If not us, then who? If not me and you, right now it's time for us to do something. If not now, then when? Will we see an end to all this pain? It's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. I'm tired of talking about how we are God's hands and feet. But it's easier to say than to be. Like Live like angels of apathy who tell ourselves, It's alright, somebody else will do something. Well, I don't know about you. But I'm sick and tired of life with no desire. I don't want a flame, I want a fire. I want to be the one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. If not us, then who? If not me and you, right now it's the time for us to do something. If not now, then when will we see an end to all this pain? It's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. And it goes on. But I think that's enough for you to get the idea. It's up to you to exemplify and hold on to those same principles that the reformers pronounced 500 years ago. Trusting in Scripture alone as your authority and your guide. Trusting in Christ alone for your salvation and well-being. Trusting in faith and grace alone and not your works to put you in a place where you can do the most good and be the best witness and remembering the last one that it's all for the glory of God not for your own and not for the church but for God there's another minister in our presbytery who likes to start her services and she looks out at the congregation and she says it's not about you and they all yell back, it's not about you either. Because it's not. Worship is about God. But so is living our lives. So my challenge to you is to be reformed. And always reforming. According to the word of God. Changing yourself through the Holy Spirit. That you live a life that witnesses to others and changes their lives as well. And to God be the glory for the great things he has done in each of our lives. 
every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next hymn is number 410, The Solid Rock. I seem to have lost my... Oh, there it is. If you'd stand, if you're able, and sing with me. that you give back joyfully, cheerfully, and generously to the work of His church. Amen.
please join me in the unison prayer of dedication, which is printed in your bulletin. Gracious God, we give our best, lest in gaining the world we lose life itself. As a covenant people, we seek to witness to your will and way. Help us to know more clearly what you would have us do with the wealth entrusted to our care. As we contribute to the needs of your people, we present ourselves as living sacrifices. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Now is the time in our worship service when we get the privilege of praying for and with each other, knowing that we need no other intermediary than Jesus Christ. There are needs which are printed in your bulletin. In an insert, I ask you to take this home, pray over it, pray over the people, because we know that God answers prayer according to His will and for His glory. And so let us come before God now, sending up our requests and giving our praise. God, our Creator, Maker of the universe, we just give you praise and glory. You are an almighty God. You are an all-wise God whose wisdom spans the universe, is greater than we can fathom in its totality. Sometimes it's greater than we can fathom even in partiality. Lord, we thank you that you understood us better than we knew ourselves. That you knew of the need that we would have for a Savior. And that you made a way for us. And Lord, we thank you for your love, which is deeper than we can ever fathom or plumb. So that when we fell short, you were willing to send the Son. And Jesus, who came and was born and lived and suffered and died to cleanse us of sin and was raised again, so that we might have new life, abundant life here on earth and eternal life with you. Lord, we, we give you thanks and praise. You are so good to us in so many ways. As long as we stay focused on you, your blessings will continue to pour out. And Lord, we ask healing for all those that are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, mental, or physical. Lord, make them whole, whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. For those that have undergone surgeries, we pray for swift recovery. For those that are going to, we pray that the hands and eyes of the doctors would be guided. For those that travel, we pray for mercies. So that they might once again join with loved ones. Lord, we give you thanks for birthdays and another year lived. And for anniversaries and a number of years lived together. And a witness that that gives to the kind of relationship you want to have with the church and each one of us. And we give you thank you for weddings to come. And for the praise and glory that will accrue to you when it's done in your honor. And you're a part of it. And Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. That you would just pour a special measure of your grace and your spirit upon them and give them peace. That peace that passes all understanding and only comes from you. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Until that time, Holy Spirit, rest upon each one of us. Give us the wisdom to see your will, the courage of heart to step out in faith, to stand up and stand firm in what we believe. To change the culture around us instead of being changed. And give us the perseverance of spirit to complete the tasks that you have called us to do. So that one day we hear those wonderful words, well done my good and faithful servant. And Holy Spirit, be poured out upon this church. Expand its boundaries and ministries. May it be a light in the darkness of this world. Showing others your love and your grace and mercy. And leading them to know who you are. And to share the gospel in all that we do and all that we say. And the good news of Jesus Christ as Savior. For we ask this in his name. Even as we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let's uh, do verses 1 and 2 of number 418. My faith has found a resting place. If you'd stand, if you're able, and sing with me. Now may you go forth from this place, recharged and renewed and ready to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, giving witness to his love and grace in your life. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. God be with you till we meet again, by his counsels guide uphold.